For those of you that have been with us um, throughout the years as we've done the learning exchange, you know the objective of today is to bring just innovative thought and principles that we might be able to take home and use in the work that we all do each and every day. Um, for those that were here several years ago when Robin Hackey was here, we talked a little bit about capital, um, is, is the problem capital or is the problem capital absorption? And, and both need to exist for things to really start changing. And so we're going to open today with a little bit of conversation um, about Melody and um, a, a theory and methodology for collaboration and building capital absorption. And then, and then Zom's going to help us talk a little bit about uh, if that is working in certain sectors, have we seen that in community development? And why or why not is that happening in community development from what he has seen throughout the world? Um, and so with that, I'm going to stop talking because you guys are the stars of the day. And I think, Melody, you're starting. Is that right? Sure. OK. Absolutely. <laughs> well, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here with you all this morning and lots of friends um, in the audience. And thank you so much, Jane. And also, thank you to you all for letting me spend some time with my friend and former um, Obama administration colleague, Zap Briggs. So that's a real pleasure. And in kicking this conversation off, uh, and the question about collaboration and collective impact um, has come up and how it came to be. And one, I'm just curious, how many people in the room are familiar with collective impact? OK, great. Um, in the course of work that I've done over the last couple of decades, um, <laughs> one of the things working not with nonprofits in the private sector, philanthropic sector, is that people were struggling with the fact that after a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of high-performing organizations trying to tackle complex challenges just weren't seeing the kind of change that we hoped for. And there was a lot of frustration around that. And then that was coupled with the fact that people also said resources are becoming more and more constrained, purse strings are being pulled even more tightly, and you mix that with the fact that there is a struggle to determine how do we align the resources we do have so that we can have the effect that we want to have. So there was a kind of a perfect storm of questions and challenges in front of all of those sectors. And at that point, enter the conversation about collective impact. And for those of you who read the Stanford Social Innovation Review, you know that this article came out in 2011 um, by Mark Kramer and John Kenya using the Strive Cradle to Career Network as an example and identifying and naming what they saw happening with Strive. At the same time, work that we were doing in the White House with a council for community solutions started to identify these same kinds of characteristics in communities around the country. No matter what the challenge was, no matter the big, hairy, audacious goal and challenge that sat in front of these communities, many of which you all are working on today, both the Stanford Social Innovation Review article and the White House Council identified the fact that work had to take place across sector. And in some, with some of the organizations I've worked with, they've said, well, this is a real moment of humility because we recognize that as hard as we try, we aren't getting the job done. But what this article said and what we noticed through our work was it doesn't have to do with the fact that the organization you're working with and for is high functioning or not. It's unrealistic to believe that a complex issue that has been brewing, not just for years, but for generations, will be solved by one single sector. So the importance is, how do we bring together actors across sectors? And in doing that, identify a common agenda. And I often say to people, uh, uh, that point of identification is critical because sometimes we think we've done it. But if you think back to your own relationships, you know, there, I may go home and say to my husband, we've got to save more money. And he may say, yeah, we do need to save more money. And I might think, well, that means that I'm going to buy one less pair of shoes a month. And he might think that you're not going to buy another pair of shoes this year. I mean, <laughs> so in other words, we have to be very, very intentional around the identification of a common agenda, which is difficult and requires trust and time. So that was identified. 
Also the fact that there needs to be some kind of coordination of these high performing actors across sectors. Because at the same time, they need mutually reinforcing activity, everybody doing what they do well, but doing it in a way that, a lot, that rolls up to this big goal that we've set together. And we need constant communication. We can't just go off and do our own thing and expect that we're going to reach the goal that we've set for ourselves. We need some kind of coordination function that's going to ensure that we're constantly talking to each other and that we're working together effectively. And in doing that, that we are using data, qualitative and quantitative data, to make sure that we have the same goal and that we're moving toward that goal. So that article and the work that we were doing at the White House said and spoke to and identified communities that were doing that kind of work and doing it effectively. One of the things, and I know we'll talk about this in a few minutes, is that that field has now grown. There are challenges that we've recognized with collective impact. We also acknowledge the fact that collective impact isn't the solution for every problem. You know, if you're a hammer, everything's a nail. <laughs> but it isn't the only solution, but it speaks to the importance of collaboration. And when disciplined, it can be effective in helping us ap approach these very, very complex goals that are sitting in all of our communities. And, and you've actually talked, uh, when we were talking about one or two successful examples that you've seen mm -hmm. in the work that you were doing. Um, I think one was in, um, um, education sector and maybe one in the health sector. Could you talk about one of them? Sure. Um, well, in the education sector, I'll, start, I'll speak to that one. In Nashville, Tennessee, in the early 2000s, 2001, 2002, there was a meeting of the Chamber of Commerce um, there and they started to align themselves with some of the nonprofits in the city because what they recognized is that they had a staggering high school graduation dropout rate. Absolutely abysmal rate. I mean, I think they had kind of a 58% graduation rate. Uh, and students in their school system coming from high levels of concentrated poverty. At the same time, there were over 175 nonprofits Again, many of them very high-performing nonprofits that had been at this work for decades, decade after decade. So they were frustrated. A lot of money had been put into this problem, but the needle wasn't moving. And what they did was come together under the auspices of the chamber, nonprofit sector, business um, community, to start to analyze why aren't we moving the needle when it comes to this challenge. At the same time, the mayor's office became involved because they were also concerned about the level of truancy in Nashville. And ultimately, they developed a master plan, a children and youth master plan for the city of Nashville to tackle this problem. And over a 10 year period, substantially raised their high school graduation rate. I'm talking about double digit um, improvement in their high school graduation rate over a 10 year period with every sector acting to do, as I mentioned before, what they could do extremely well. So you had the school system sitting at the table, you had the mayor's office sitting at the table, you had parent and student organizations at the table, all working under a form of, government, of governance that had been articulated through this master plan so that they could all move in the same direction tackle the transportation problems that they recognized were a problem with students trying to get to school, um, to address uh, the problems with data so that everyone in Nashville understood exactly where they stood and they could follow that and track that over a period of time, and that they were also getting feedback from students and from the community in doing this. And I know we'll talk about this, but it isn't as though the business leaders went off somewhere with the heads of nonprofit organizations and came up with the plan. They engaged students, they engaged parents, they engaged teachers, they engaged everyone in the community to come to the table and say, this is our challenge, this is what we need, and here's a way that we can sustainably work together to come up with a plan for our students and for our city that's resilient, will last over time, and has proven 
to be tremendously successful in bringing down their dropout rate and raising their graduation rate. Collaboration, convening. Um, they, you sit in, in a great position of being both a funder and at points in your career, a practitioner in community economic development. Um, have, have you seen this principle in your work? Uh, maybe why or why not, mm -hmm. if you haven't? Um, and can you talk a little bit about that? I'd love to. First of all, uh, Jane, a huge thank you to you and your oh, team thank you. and the VCC board, uh, which I got to, lo uh, to know last night. Um, it's, it's a huge treat and a privilege to be here. Um, and I want to wish the Learning Exchange many more years of outgrowing your space. <laughs> thank you. Um, that's a great sign. But while we're here, this is a gorgeous space, and I'm uh, just delighted to be here with, with all of you. You know, the, the, the quick answer is that collective impact, per se, has not really come to community economic development yet. What has come, of course, is, let's call it, highly effective collaboration of particular kinds. Now, at the end of the day, collective impact was born to promote exactly that. It's a framework. It's a set of ideas. I, I think it's no accident that it has been applied first. As Melody was saying, it's a tool at the end of the day. It's about something being fit to purpose. It has been applied first in areas like, like health and human services. And, um, and I think we'll see much more application of it. Community economic development, as, as many of us in this room know, as all of us know, it is a bit different. And I think one of the reasons we haven't seen this, this excellent framework for a disciplined, kind of highly effective collaborative effort uh, take hold is that in, in community economic development, we tend to be more diffuse. We want to we want to solve a bunch of different things, and often we want to solve all of them yesterday, <laughs> type thing. Um, whether it be business starts, you know, quality employment, skilling, a whole host of, of things. So that's that's both a strength and sometimes a challenge uh, if you're trying to create alignment in a community around a couple of really big priorities and then work out. As Melody was saying, well, how exactly do we produce that? I mean, if, you, if you wanted to do that and you wanted to, you know, triple the scale and the rate of progress that you've had over the last ten years. What would it take, actually? Let's be real specific about what it would take. But the, the other thing I want to add is, I think it's worth making a broader point, at least as we kick off this conversation. In economic development itself is going through a profound transformation in this country. I think that's important for Richmond. I think it's important for where I live. I think it's important for all the communities in which I'm able to visit and you know, work with, with partners. Um, we are learning that equity and inclusion are critical to growth. I want to say that again. It's not just that we would like growth to be inclusive, that we find that morally compelling, consistent with our values as a country. It is certainly true in that sense. It is also better for growth. It's a smarter way to grow. We have Nobel quality economic analysis to teach us that now. So the question is, are we going to act on that? And how will our practice look different? And what does it mean for concrete partnerships in Richmond, other parts of Virginia? or other parts of the country. If you think back about where this field came from, local economic development practice in particular, born roughly in the 1930s, and the original idea, it's pretty much a rising tide will lift all boats. I mean, if you, if you promote growth, everyone will benefit. We now have the facts to show us that simply cannot be taken for granted. It's often not true. Um, and number two, it's, it's more or less grounded on an idea that you compete, your community will be prosperous, if you lower the cost of business. That's been a dominant idea for, for a long time. So it led to a big emphasis on you know, attracting companies with tax credits and land concessions and tax concessions and, and that kind of thing. Not enough, let's, let's grow our own, let's grow locally, or let's put together the attraction together with uh, local entrepreneurship and, and things like that. So the whole field is going through a profound sea change. It's uh, none too soon, because it's critical, Again, inclusive growth is a smarter way to grow. We have the proof of that now. And it cannot be done except with what, what Melody was talking about, highly effective collaboration. There's no other way to do it, because the next economy, and folks, it's already here in so many ways as we're seeing, it doesn't guarantee good jobs for everybody, unfortunately. We have to work at that. Your stat this morning was very compelling. About, a, about a quarter of all jobs in America are poverty wage jobs. Right? So a we quarter. as a country, about a quarter, we as a country became, this is what I said this morning, I've got you know, the data for anyone who wants to see it, we became, as the world's most advanced economy, the wealthiest economy, we became the most prolific creator of bad jobs. We, America, 
Chinese didn't do it to us. You know, technology alone didn't to, do it to us. We, we made choices. And we need to make different ones. And we need to get aligned you know, at the local level and beyond uh, in order to, to do that. But without alignment, without collaboration, uh, around things like good jobs, good jobs for all, um, we can't succeed in the economy that's, that's emerging. I mean, it's fundamentally about skills and innovation and connectivity. Competing on you know, a marginally lower cost of business than the next state over, or than China, or Vietnam, or that is not a recipe for the future we need. So it's crucial that we, we figure out how to bring, bring the best of these frameworks into our practice. And you're now in economic development, but you also did some work at HUD and in housing, and, and, and some of the books that you've written and papers you've written have been around um, the, the need for decent housing, and there's housing practitioners in this room. Have you seen it in the housing arena? Or have you seen the housing arena start blending with the economic development arena? I think that, uh, yes, we have. Um, the, the, the best we can say, the strengths of the field, I think, in many ways, are that we've learned how to do highly effective public-private, not-for-profit collaboration. We've learned that the communities that fare best at producing new affordable housing and preserving what they've got, enhancing it, adapting to new needs like the growth of the elderly population. It's one of the most tectonic things going on in our country. As we're all aging. <laughs> there, there's that. Yeah, we all resemble that remark. But I mean, it, it, you know, we're, we're just not ready yet. We really aren't um, for the demographic changes. And we have to get ready real, real fast. We need to make faster progress. So the housing field has a set of strengths there. What it has not yet achieved we haven't learned, I think, to tell the story and, and build the will to resource what we know how to do. Um, so we haven't made the progress that, that, that we need yet. And number two, um, our greatest successes have generally been at sort of the project and the development level. You can go to any community in the land and people can point to a development or um, you know, a, a block of apartments or a row of, of homes that are owned by homeowners that didn't have a chance before to become, and that's fabulous, that's, that's wonderful, it happens across the country. But it's not yet functioning at the level of an all-in effort by a community to say, we're not gonna have an inclusive economy that really thrives unless working families of all levels can afford a decent, safe, secure place to live. It just doesn't work, it doesn't add up. Point. In order to have that, we must do what? You know, what's the X, Y, Z? What follows from that proposition? That's very much a collective impact friendly sort of question, but we haven't, we haven't taken that approach yet. Um, when, this morning when we talked about collective impact, um, I, I, I talked and asked you to pull out a little bit about um, convening is hard work. Mm -hmm. uh, collaboration takes time and coordination and management. And um, if you have five or six different actors from a community um, coming together to align around a single goal, um, who's playing that role of bringing them together? Mm -hmm. is, is there any patterns in any of that? Or is it different by community? Or what have you mm -hmm. seen? Um, I've seen difference across communities. A lot of times it depends on how the collaborative work evolves, who or what is the catalyst for it. Uh, in addition, and I think Wayne mentioned it, I do work, I chair the Aspen Forum for Community Solutions, and we're doing work in many, about 24 urban, rural, and tribal communities across the country. So we've seen a lot of different kinds of collaboratives that have evolved to work on the education to employment pathway for young adults. And at the same time, I also reflect on the work that I saw when I was doing the, uh, working at the White House. So I've seen mayor's offices serve as catalysts for this work, with it maybe starting there, but often transitioning out into its own nonprofit. I've seen colleges and universities serve as the backbone and the orchestrator for this work. Um, I think of some really interesting work that's happening in New Orleans right now in Tulane playing an essential role there. I've also seen a couple of organizations, including philanthropy, come together with a university or community college to serve um, as the coordinator for the work. The, the critical issue, I think, is less 
the actor, whether it's a nonprofit or a university, it's often you know it's nonprofit or a government entity, but it's the characteristics that are important. That the 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 backbone or the orchestrator um, of this work isn't the leader. It's not the person that's going you are going to flip on the evening news and see standing in front of the cameras. That the entity and the individuals and that entity are there to be actually in the background. They are trusted. They have the capacity to coordinate the function. They may be the keeper of the repository for data and information. They can call the meeting and people will come. And in all the communities that you all work in, you know who those people are. Or you know who those organizations are. And it may not be the one with the big fancy title, but it's the one that people say, oh yeah, the XYZ you know, nonprofit called and we're going. So that is, I think, an essential element to, to this work. It is, unfortunately, the place, the, the thing that is most, is least likely to be funded. And in fact, that was part of the impetus for our work at the Aspen Institute and the regranting of funds that we do into those communities. We are funding the backbone um, because it's the thing that no one else wants to fund. They want to fund the stuff that seems really sexy and that you get that immediate gratification from. You get immediate gratification if you think, well, these are more children I've, that I've put into preschool, not I have funded the capacity building background organization that's a repository for data. You know, it doesn't, that doesn't necessarily get you up in the morning. It warm. Right, exactly. But, but it is absolutely essential to the work. Are you going to add something on that? Absolutely. That, that uh, question you asked too. If I think about communities that have impressed me that are stepping up mm -hmm. and acting collectively and, and doing it at a meaningful scale, meaning a you know, mm -hmm. scale commensurate with the, with the challenges, there are things going on in Detroit, coming back from the abyss, I mean, from a mm -hmm. terrific, right, depopulation, distre um, um, distress, fiscal crisis, of course, biggest municipal bankruptcy in American history, all of that, um, all the years of segregation and, and, and conflict, who lives yeah. where, and so on. Um, also in New Orleans, likewise yeah, after a, a kind of catastrophe, a very different one, but post-Katrina, and it includes these very elements that, that Melody's talking about, so mayors have been crucial in both instances. Both of them would be the first to say it's much larger than me, and they are spinning out and spinning right. off these kinds of institutions that offer this, this critical capacity. And what's so compelling about them is that, consistent with collective impact, they're relentless about results on specific things. And they, and they stay the course to focus on those things. An example would be, um, growing and getting people into middle-skill, middle-wage jobs. Saying, you know, the poverty wage jobs are not enough. It's not enough mm -hmm. to just count up how many jobs are being created in this economy. What, it's the quality of jobs we care about. It's who has meaningful access to those jobs that we care about. We care about linking it to, you know, ending mass incarceration in our state and, and creating opportunities for those that are especially disadvantaged, that have extra barriers to, to overcome. So relentless about, you know, what's the goal exactly, and then aligning around that, um, and doing so at a scale that's really impressive, working with their big employers, their small ones, promoting local entrepreneurship, not just attracting outside companies. They have those kinds of qualities to them, too. The last thing I want to mention is a really interesting example, and that is the Working Cities Challenge. It's not well known yet, and it's still in its early years, but it's well worth watching. Launched by the Boston Federal Reserve Bank, very unusual player to get into something yeah. like this. Uh, Ford helped to fund it in the, in the early stages. We think that's a part of our, part of our role. It targets smaller cities, uh, smaller towns that lost factories generations ago and have never come back, okay? So some of the mm -hmm. hardest hit parts. Uh, in Massachusetts. Exactly, in Massachusetts. Yeah. Now it's spreading to the neighboring states. Uh, the Boston Fed has the whole New England area. And other regional Federal Reserve Banks are very interested in this, and I think that's good news. I know you're gonna be having new leadership here in the Richmond Fed. Dear friend of ours, uh, Obama colleague, Rafael Bostic, um, is now leading the Atlanta Federal Reserve. He's enormously yeah. interested. First uh, African-American Federal Reserve president in Atlanta. Um, really interested and in, in creative. And so, um, you know, this suggests there's some unusual suspects, too, who bring enormous analytic capacity, credibility um, to leverage into these kinds of, these kinds of partnerships. And they're starting to play in this arena. Yep. Absolutely. 
So um, you brought up that you funded that initiative. I think um, Ford's done some unique things with mm -hmm. um, not only grants, but you're now starting to use your corpus to really kind of leverage your impact. Can you talk a little bit about that? I, I would uh, love to. We announced earlier this year that we'll be investing a billion dollars of our endowment over the next decade. And we all know what a billion is. Wayne helped us explain that. <laughs> it's a lot. He pointed out it's not very relatable, but we know it's big. And we'd like to try to relate. Yeah, yes. <laughs> He's motivated to relate to that. Um, we're going to be investing a billion dollars of our endowment in so-called impact investing or, or double bottom line investing. On one hand, we have been investing with financial return and social impact in mind since the 1960s. We've been at this a while, learned a lot, learned some of it the hard way. I'll be the first <laughs> to acknowledge we made lots of mistakes over the years. But we had always done it from, if you will, the, the charitable side of the foundation. So under, you know, under US tax law and under IRS guidelines, we had done program-related investments. And over the long course of it, that, that fund had, had more or less broken even. And, and here's the thing. We were content with that. We thought our job was to take risk, to help give birth to the CDFI movement in yep. this country. Thank you. Um, <laughs> to, to work on the, the analog, microfinance, lending to extremely poor people in other countries like Bangladesh and India and Kenya. We're proud to be associated with all that. And uh, again, it was, it was not about making money so much as recycling the money, if you, if you get my meaning. But we felt as though you know, the, the investment marketplace is changing and changing in some very encouraging ways. There is a growing appetite um, here in this country and in Japan and Brazil and Germany and China and other parts of the world as well to better align our investment dollars with our values. You see that with individuals, you see it with institutions. It is enormously encouraging, it's powerful, but it won't just work on autopilot. We've got to be intentional about creating the market infrastructure, creating the standards, as some folks are calling it, creating the plumbing, which is related to your conversation with Robin yeah. about being able to absorb capital, not just make it available. And so we, we are walking the road now, and you know, when we sit there at the table with everyone from Prudential to such and such a pension fund, university endowment, high net worth individuals, sovereign wealth funds overseas doing some incredible things. We felt like we needed to be uh, walking the talk. We needed to be investing our own corpus, our own endowment, because after all, we survive on that. All the grants around the world, everything we, we've been known for, depends on earning returns um, mm -hmm. on, those, on those dollars, on those assets. So this is a new stage uh, for us, and we're initially focusing on affordable housing in the US and financial inclusion in the developing world. Technology is bringing amazing access and change um, to markets that have never before included, in some cases, half of their population in the financial system. Practice of that um, is, is really important to us in developing that. And we think taking our time and doing it right is also important, because hype does not serve us. Overpromising does not serve us. Pretending it's easy to deploy a billion dollars really well, that's not going to serve the Ford Foundation or the field or anybody else. Right. Um, with that, uh, let's give them a round of applause for a wonderful conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.